Yesterday was 161 years the Battle of Antietam, or Sharpsburg, depending on what side of the Mason-Dixon line uh, you were on. I know all three of us in this room have done the tour of the Antietam battlefield. Only, only one of us, however, was kind enough to point out that he was superior enough as a male to have walked the entire tour himself and not driven it, and that, of course, would be yours truly, the Admiral. <laughs> so, Bill, if you could, please relay the tone to Mr. Gilstrap of what you said you walked the, the battlefield. No, no way. What said off-air should remain <laughs> off-air. The conversation went. <laughs> well, I was a little disappointed that he had to drive it, and, and Rob said, well, no, you can walk it. I said, really? And, and Bill said, I've walked it. <laughs> and I said, well, good for you. La-dee-da. <laughs> so, Bill, just another way of showing your superiority over everybody else. Not, not to my buddy John Gilstrap. <laughs> our, our guest on the program has uh, written a book. I think Dylan's about to bring it up there on the screen for us when hell came to Sharpsburg. And uh, Steve Cowley is his name. He joins us via telephone. Steve, good morning. How are you, sir? Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Do you prefer Steve or Stephen, by the way? Whatever you prefer. Uh, Steve is just fine. Excellent. Uh, you are going to be in Shepherdstown on the 21st of this week. That's Thursday. Can you tell us about the program that you will do and the particulars? Yes, absolutely. I'll be, I'll be coming up this week to, uh, to give several talks in the area, and on Thursday... Um, I've been invited to speak on – it's kind of a parallel of the structure of my book, which is investigating the various ways that the Battle of Antietam and its aftermath impacted the, the Sharpsburg area, uh, you know, specifically the civilians. And what time will your program get underway? I'll be starting that program at 7 p.m. this Thursday. 7 p.m. So uh, tell me your interest in this book and what got you started on it. Well, I, the history bug uh, rubbed off on me at an early age. My dad was a social studies teacher, so I got the bug, but I spent most of my life growing up on the West Coast and didn't have access to visiting all these wonderful battlefields that we have back here. And um, basically what happened was I, I had kept this interest in uh, the Civil War, and it really skewed towards Antietam around the, the late 80s, early 90s, when we had all these uh, kind of pop culture uh, Civil War uh, programs that came out, the, the Ken Burns series, the movie Glory. Um, anyways, long story short, I became very fixated with Antietam, and it wasn't until I made a life change and moved to Tennessee in the early 2000s that I realized that now I finally have um, better driving access to visit these wonderful battlefields back here. So the first place I visited was Sharpsburg, and the place just grabbed a hold of me. I knew right then and there that I wanted to write about it, and so the journey began. 132,000 forces engaged, 87,000 on the Union side, 45,000 Confederates, 22,717 estimated casualties, 12,401 on the Union side, 10,316 on the Confederate side. It is the single bloodiest day in American history, Steve. Yes, and I have to ask, did you have all that memorized off the top of your head, or were you reading it? <laughs> when, when you do a show with, a, with, the, with an admiral, you have to be up on your military facts, Stephen. You can't take anything for granted, because he's waiting to pounce over there. <laughs> I'm pouncing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, go ahead, Bill. Okay, uh, uh, before we go too much farther, we mentioned off-air, but I do not think we mentioned on-air. It's going to be at the old opera house on, um, on Thursday. Is that correct? Yes, that's okay. That's yeah. correct. Yeah, the uh, Shepherdstown Opera House will host the venue, and the event is being organized by the George Tyler Moore Center for um, the Study of the Civil War. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that the, your book is on the impact of the residents. Uh, did you, by, they no longer do it, unfortunately, but did you by chance ever go to the candlelight tour uh, held on the anniversary of the battle at, in Sharpsburg? 
Oh, you've I have not had. Yeah, I have not had the anniversary to to actually okay. uh, see the uh, the candlelight luminaries that are lit. I believe that takes place in December, and I have never been to the area in December. Um, but it's on my bucket list to see for no, sure. Two different things. They do have the luminary in December, first week in December, if, if memory serves. But until about four years or so ago, they had what they called a candlelight tour on the twentieth of September, and it was uh, it was the it was built around the residents themselves, their reaction to the upcoming battle, their reaction during the battle, and shortly after the battle. And the early days actually had horses running through uh, the uh, the grounds uh, till they felt it was too dangerous. But you could smell the horses. You felt you were in a candlelight tour. It was, I think, probably the most moving event I've ever experienced. We went for three or four years, uh, and as I said unfortunately they no longer do that. But they do still have the luminary in early December. Yes, I've, I've actually seen some of that footage that you're describing about the battle's aftermath yeah, yeah, with the candlelight yeah, vigil, and yeah. I never have had the opportunity yeah. to experience that. I hope they bring it back. I do, too. It's uh, it's very, very moving. So, yeah. so <clears throat> this is John Gilstrap. Good morning. So let's talk about the, the initiation of what we now know as the, as the Battle of Antietam or of Sharpsburg. Were the... Um, Gettysburg, for example, started kind of as an accident. The skirmish lines found each other, and then it and it and it blew up from there. How did not not line for line, but what was the origin of the battle that as it as it started there? Yes, well, just to give uh, listeners who aren't familiar with uh, just kind of a uh, just a really simplistic summary of the uh, the Maryland campaign. Um, would you like me to go in and, and just give a brief description about sure. how the armies arrived in Sharpsburg? Sure. sure. Well, in, in, in simplest terms, uh, by early September 1862, uh, General Robert E. Lee, commanding the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia, he had seized momentum of the war after a string of victories the previous summer. And he took the war north for the first time by entering Maryland. And by mid-September, General George McClellan, commanding the Army of the Potomac for the United States, had caught up to the Confederates. And after a string of, of um, after a string of battles on South Mountain, the armies ended up in the small farming community of Sharpsburg, um, near Antietam Creek, from where the battle gets its name. Of course, in the South, they referred to it as the Battle of Sharpsburg. And uh, that that pretty much explains how the armies arrived in Sharpsburg. A big reason for it is that um, the, the bridge that connected Sharpsburg and Shepherdstown uh, before the war was burned by Confederates at the, uh, in, the, in the early months of, of the war in 1861. And that left a narrow, um, not, sorry, it was a shallow part of the Potomac River near Sharpsburg called Blackford's Ford, also known as Shepherdstown Ford and other names. But that was really the only major crossing point of the Potomac River between Williamsport and Harper's Ferry for an army to cross. So that was a big reason why uh, Lee chose to kind of move his army towards Sharpsburg to use that crossing as a potential way to get into back to Virginia, which is now West Virginia, if necessary. Am I not correct that Lee was trying to avoid the war, uh, the battle, uh, battle at Sharpsburg and Tatum, uh, but the Union forces caught up with him, so he had no choice uh, uh, because he did not want to be called halfway across the river, so he had to turn and engage? Yeah, there's a lot of um, – historians will, will, will have, have some interesting debate on, on Lee's options at that point, but – one thing that, that really is, is interesting in this campaign is that Lee had divided his army um, in the Maryland campaign earlier in September, and he had a large portion of his, of his command down at Harper's Ferry when the Union Army had caught up to him at Sharpsburg. So Lee was uh, definitely trying to buy some time in Sharpsburg for Stonewall Jackson and the rest of his command to come up and join him. It's at that point where historians might debate should, should Lee had crossed the river at that point before the, the Battle of Antietam erupted, or would his army have been destroyed while attempting to cross that river if he wanted to find a, um, a different position rather than Sharpsburg? But what happened was he decided to make a stand, and it culminated in the, in the single bloodiest day in American military history, which was the Battle of Antietam. 
So as I understand, the focus of the book deals with the civilians, uh, part of the book anyway, deals with the civilians' reactions. So talk about that a little bit. I mean, here you are, you're making breakfast, and all of a sudden you see 120,000 soldiers in your backyard. Absolutely. Well, what happened was the, the Antietam impacted the community emotionally, physically, and financially. And, you know, during the battle, of course, you had the terror and the, uh, the stress of all these civilians. Many of them had to evacuate their homes and take refuge along the Potomac River and other places, while others went down into the cellars in the town of Sharpsburg in those brick and stone homes, and they took their chances on cramming into those those basements, um, hoping that these uh, these missiles, <laughs> you know, all the artillery shells directed at the town of Sharpsburg um, would not penetrate those walls. So they suffered in that regard. Uh, but also when they after the battle, a lot of these uh, buildings were destroyed. There were several houses that were gone. Um, and you also had the medical department took over the area uh, to transform a lot of these properties, m most of them in the area into field hospitals, and as a result, that displaced many families who had no choice but to find shelter elsewhere because there was no room for them in their own houses. So they had to deal with the physicality of have, having to actually find other places to live. And then, of course, diseases came through the area with the armies, and it killed a number of residents. And the last part, which I can get into, I'll take a breath and let you all throw in another question if you want, but financially this area was absolutely devastated by the Army's presence because of uh, issues with supply shortages. Yeah, uh, building upon Antietam, and the, it really is a jewel for historians. Uh, it is, is it, with the possible exception of Shiloh, uh, it remains in the most pristine state of any battle, unlike Gettysburg, Manassas, where uh, uh, various things have encroached upon it. Antietam does not allow reenactments uh, because of the uh, uh, the the sacredness of the ground. Uh, so when you tour Antietam, you're literally touring it very much like it was September the twentieth, uh, eighteen sixty-two. So. Yeah, I, absolutely. And that was part of the reason that grabbed a hold of me when I saw that area for the first time, because it's, um, you know, the Na National Park Service has done such a wonderful job in preserving anything, everything, not just the battlefield proper, but in purchasing all the easements to ensure that you're not looking over and seeing billboards in the distance and telephone lines and, uh, you know, restaurants and so forth. You really do feel like you're stepping into some sort of a time capsule. Yeah, I, I drive through there every day on my way home, past Antietam Battlefield and through the town of Sharpsburg, and it is pristine. It is pristine. It, it, exactly, there's no McDonald's yeah. hanging around the corner, and as you said, there aren't billboards, and it, it is it is as it was. Yeah, and the other thing I mentioned uh, in reenactments, it's a big thing in most battlefields to have some sort of reenactments. Mm -hmm. They do have reenactments around Antietam, but they're all held on private land and nothing on the on the in the battlefield itself. I have a kind of a disgusting but practical question. Um, the day after the battle, when the armies have left, they've left behind a lot of dead horses, a lot of dead and wounded men, a lot of destruction, uh, a lot of destruction. But the, it's um, it's more of the, the biological uh, destruction that I'm that I'm thinking of. What happened right now? There's a very pretty cemetery. It's it's, it's awe inspiring cemetery is there, but that's not where they died. How did the citizens deal with the carnage in the aftermath? Because therein lies a lot of potential disease. It was horrible. It was absolutely horrible. And one of the uh, one of the ways that these citizens of Sharpsburg benefited compared to Gettysburg is that the army, McClellan's army, stuck around for almost six weeks after the battle. Oh. Of course, that wreaked havoc on the community from a supply perspective. But the army took care of most of the burial duty as opposed to Gettysburg, where my understanding is a lot of the civilians were, were asked to help with burying the dead. But civilians at Sharpsburg were responsible for, for interring some of those remains. But what they witnessed upon returning home from their evacuation sites, it was just horrible. Um, you know, not just the, the bodies, but when you look into the civilian accounts, they're describing uh, <clears throat> and largely body parts, what was left of these soldiers. It was such a savage battle, especially with all the artillery. But with um, 
with the with the need to bury all these soldiers so quickly, what the soldiers did was they uh, they ended up laying all the deceased into burial trenches, most of them into mass graves, and these graves were very shallow, and it really didn't take much. When you have almost 4,000 dead that you're burying right there, it didn't take much for the earth to settle or whether it was a storm or a foraging animal, but a lot of these graves became exposed in a short amount of time where you're seeing human limbs protruding. Uh, feral hogs were getting into the graves and removing a lot of the body parts. You had, what you had ultimately was bones strewn all over a lot of these fields because the remains were not transferred to the Antietam National Cemetery, and that process didn't begin until late 1865. And with the Confederate dead, they were not removed to their final resting place until the early 1870s. So it was really horrifying for visitors to come into the area and see skulls and femur bones just laying out in the open. For the residents, we can only imagine what they had to uh, deal with to process all these horrible sites. It may have just become part of their benumbed new normal, if you will. Our guest is Steve Cowie, author of the book, When Hell Came to Sharpsburg. He'll be in Shepherdstown this Thursday as we commemorate the 106th anniversary of the Battle of uh, Sharpsburg slash Antietam. Uh, this week, you came across some journals and some diaries and such. What were some of the more moving entries in that research that you found, Steve? Well, one of the one of the interesting sources that I was able to find was I went to the National Archives and I um, I ended up locating about 250 war claims which were filed by the citizens in attempt to uh, receive compensation from the federal government for their losses and this. This totaled about 3,000 pages, and it included sworn testimonies and um, affidavits and petitions of losses. So that, in combination with a lot of the letters and so forth, really um, gave a comprehensive feel for the, you know, for for what happened to these, you know, within a five-mile radius of the battlefield. Perhaps part of the moving evidence was the medical diaries, uh, medical ledgers of Sharpsburg's doctor during the war. His name was Dr. Augustin A. Biggs. And I had access to his original medical ledgers, and by cross-referencing that information with local death and burial records, I was shocked to see the spike in sickness and death in the civilian population after the battle. And I wasn't able to actually kind of quantify exactly how many people died as a result of the disease outbreak, but um, it may have numbered in the dozens. Steve, you mentioned compensation, and there was phenomenal damage, not only on the battleground, but uh, on the outskirts. Uh, I've been told that uh, to be compensated, it had to be demonstrated the damage happened or incurred from the federal side. If it's from the Confederate side, there'd be no compensation. Is that correct? Yes, that's, that's correct, and when I started investigating the rules of all these claims acts that were passed after the war, it got actually more um, draconian, if you will, because Confederate losses, the United States government, they were not going to issue any sort of settlements for that whatsoever, but there were a number of other categories that were barred uh, under the jurisdiction of these claims act, and that included anything related to combat. So for the Muma farmhouse on the Antietam battlefield, it wouldn't have mattered if Union soldiers had set fire to that house because combat-related damages were not covered under, the, uh, under these acts. Also, anything related to theft and depredations or hospital rent, those were all excluded as well. And I could talk for 15 more minutes giving you a list of everything that was not allowed in these acts. So by the time – uh, you know, by the time the investigations were completed, there was very little remaining for the, uh, for these people to receive settlements from the government. And as a result, uh, the, the the final payments were, when they did occur years after the battle, uh, they were extremely small. I did not realize that anything related to combat was excluded because the whole battle was combat. So how, yeah, I would not think there's anything other than combat. Yes, and that's where, the, that's where it gets interesting because McClellan's army stretched from Williamsport to Harper's Ferry after the battle. So you had all those encampments, and there was a severe supply shortage in the Army of the Potomac in the medical commissary and quartermaster departments. And until depots could be established in Hagerstown and Frederick, 
the army really had turned Sharpsburg into their emergency supply depot. So that's where a lot of those non-combat losses occurred uh, was in the battle's aftermath. But, yeah, anything related to marching or uh, fighting, if you had uh, artillery posted in a cornfield and that corn was smashed down as a result, you couldn't claim that. You could only claim the losses of crops if you could prove beyond a shadow of doubt that all the, you know, all the, the hay and the corn and the wheat was fed uh, legitimately to the army horses of the United States. That was the only way the government was going to pay you for those crops, for example. Steve, do you do any military analysis during the course of the book, or is this strictly about the effect on the local citizenry? I really concentrate on the, the local citizenry, but I do give um, some some examples of what the military was experiencing uh, during and after the battle for proper context to explain to readers why the Army was in such desperate need for these supplies. You know, and you think about how bloody this battle was, and had McClellan made a few different decisions, it could have been even bloodier. Uh, Absolutely, yeah, and that's where, you know, there's a lot of debate with historians as to whether McClellan should have attacked on the, the, on September 18th, the day after the battle. But when you really look at the condition of, of his army, um, it's just with with the command structure shattered and so forth, and the you know the you know the depleted ammunition from the Battle of Antietam. It was really that would have really been a risky move, in my opinion, for mm-hmm. McClellan yeah, to but have not, attacked at that. And Lee had the high ground. I was going to say, but not Abraham Lincoln's view. Correct. Abraham Lincoln felt McClellan made a classic mistake. Yeah. 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 yeah that's correct. And you know, Abraham Lincoln did take the initiative when. When Lee took his army across the Potomac River and withdrew from Maryland on September 18th, uh, it was actually the the day after the battle, the evening of September 18th, Lincoln um, seized that moment to issue the preliminary emancipation proclamation. But he also wanted McClellan to get across the Potomac River in pursuit of of Lee, and he did uh, seem to lose his patience. He even came – President Lincoln also as as, – some people m- might not be aware, but he came, he visited Sharpsburg in early October 1862 to meet with McClellan over um, over this concern and other matters as well. John, final question for author Steve Cowie. Just the the amount of research that has gone into the, the various vet battles of the Civil War, I find to be amazing and that there is new ground to be forged is is impressive i'm anxious to read your book i have not yet but i am anxious to thank you very much that was one part of my research that was difficult is that the, these documents at the national archives at the time that i researched them were not digitized but we can just imagine when materials like those are actually digitized what what other um what other new revelations of the Civil War will, will um, be released into the world in the form of all these new publications and new discoveries. I'm really looking forward to that day. Uh, one more quick question. Uh, give us a little bit of history to the is it George Tyler Moore uh, Museum in, uh, or studies in, studies in Shepherd, uh, Shepherd University. Yes, the George Tyler Moore Center for the Study of Civil War is, is based in Shepherdstown. And I had the privilege of, of visiting uh, with Dr. Jim Brumall over there and his staff, and, and they just have an, a wonderful uh, repository, a collection of Civil War documents and artifacts and so forth. And um, we're really, really privileged to have them as part of that community. Thursday at 7 o'clock, Steve Cowie will be there with his book, When Hell Came to Sharpsburg, 161 Years Since the Battle of Antietam. Steve, great to have you on the show today. Very much enjoyed it. Very informative. Thank you all very much for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you all this morning. Where can we find your book, sir? Well, the book is selling like hotcakes, but uh, there may be a few copies left on Amazon because the publisher has actually run out of uh, copies in hardcover and paperback, and I hope that they'll reprint them sometime soon. But if you can find them on Amazon in the meanwhile, get them while you can. (laughs) Will Will you have any with you at your appearance on Thursday? Yes, Four Seasons Books, based out of Shepherdstown, will have some copies on hand to sell at the event. Very nice. Great bookstore. Thank you, sir. Have a great day. You too. Thank you all.